Hello, everyone. Welcome to class four of the machine learning course. And um, I'll read this SIGGRAPH policy against harassment. This live stream is moderated by ACM SIGGRAPH. We ask that all comments be respectful of others and respect ACM's policy against harassment. This means to exercise consideration and respect in your speech and actions. Refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior and speech. And please be mindful of your fellow participants. All right, so let's get started. And welcome again to uh, class four. Um, today, um, uh, we have Leon Geddes as our guest. And we'll be talking about uh, neural style transfer and some of the other work he's been doing. So let's, um, let me share my slides are visible. And, um, so just introducing Leon. So Leon um, um, introduced this uh, technique called neural style transfer in his uh, very popular paper. And actually, I have to admit, this is the paper that got me started in the field because it seemed approachable. And uh, I looked at the results, and I'm like, I want to do this kind of things. And uh, so I owe a lot of my machine learning um, um, entry into the field to Leon. Um, so let's uh, meet Leon. Hi, Leon. Welcome to the course. Yes, yeah, so hey, I've Josh. been looking forward to meeting you for a long time. And then uh, this is kind of a dream come true. I'm like a big uh, fanboy. <laughs> so, um, um, well, thanks. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for having me. Uh, absolute uh, pleasure and honor to be here. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, like I do with all guests, like uh, can you uh, describe a little bit about your background, uh, how you got into the field, and uh, where you went to school, but, um, what kinds of things you've done so far? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, actually, I did my I did my undergrad in theoretical physics at at UCL in London, um, and I was very interested in quantum physics and you know knowing how the world works. But then I, I very, you know, soon I figured that most of the exciting physics that we can sort of experience in our daily life is, is studied very well already. <laughs> but uh, then I met Matthias. So that's my PhD advisor, Matthias Bethke. And he, he basically introduced me to this whole complex, exciting and complex system, the brain, right? So, um, and then I realized that there's a lot of interesting stuff to study about the brain and how the brain processes information and we understand very little of it. So I got into computational neuroscience and we were studying the visual system. So I, I started my, I got really excited about this idea and I started my PhD with them. And we were interested in understanding how the human visual system processes information. And there was this really nice uh, setup in, in, in that lab that we were really trying to study a vision from you know, the neuro, uh, the neuroscience uh, basis, right? So actual neural activity to sort of normative approaches of how any information processing system should, um, should uh, process visual information and sort of the machine learning aspect to actually running perceptual experiments. And so in that setting, we, we kind of came across this idea of studying texture perception. Right, and so the exciting thing about texture perception is that if you look at a texture, the actual pixel values are very different in different uh, positions of the image, but they all kind of look the same, right? They give you the same visual um, impression, no matter where you look in, in, uh, at, in, a, in a texture. And so there's some computation happening in your, in your brain that is grouping information together and giving you this, this visual impression, right? And then when I started my PhD, there was actually just the time when you know AlexNet came out and and the whole deep learning hype started, at least in the in the visual uh, community. And yeah, and then we you know we thought, hey, this is a pretty pretty good model of uh, human information processing, right? These neural networks, uh, and let's try to use that to to model texture perception and see if we can generate images that. Uh, generate the same texture or a different image, but the same texture as a given example. And that's sort of how the, 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 you know, that's sort of how the whole um, thing that became style transfer in the end started. But it was really, 
in fact, in, in the beginning, we thought about it as a tool to generate rate stimuli to uh, record neural activity to and to generate stimuli for which we could predict the neural activity in a specific way. Um, oh, wow, that's pretty fascinating. And I think to me, like the the biggest part was like, uh, how do you figure out like what what is content and what is style uh, of an image? Can you describe a little bit of that? Like, how do you partition that, or how do you even? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's a great, great question. And um, I should say that I'm, you know, we have, we, we sort of, we offer a specific hypothesis of how you could model style and how you could model content in that paper. But what style is and what content is, is of course ill-defined. And so the hypothesis we offer in that paper and, and that we explore how well that works is to say, uh, let's imagine the, the style of an image is sort of its texture um, information. So sort of the, the collection, uh, the unordered collection of visual features, of local visual features um, that together, group together, make, make, the, make up the texture of the image. And as the content, let's assume that the content is sort of the overall structure of the image. Um, that is invariant to changes in the low level pixel values, mm -hmm. right? And there's sort of this natural connection to neural networks because as you, as you go higher up in the network, uh, we, you know, the network is trying to predict object identity and an object is still the same object independent of the exact shape or the exact color or, you know, the exact, exact local parts. And so, there was this natural correspondence to, to um, model the content as a neural activation in the higher layers of the network. And then for the texture, it was sort of this natural uh, fit for the collected, collected activations in the inter lower and intermediate layers of the network. Okay. Um, so sort of just, just you know, destroy the, or get rid of the ordering information in those local features and just, you know, Use a whole collection of that, and and that's sort of the model that we that we uh, put forward or explore in the paper, and um, yeah, and you can you can sort of see look at the results, and you can you can say oh this agrees with my notion of style or it doesn't, and then you know you can iterate and have discussions about it, and, and people did, and that was very exciting. Yeah. Oh, that was really cool, actually. And then how how did you even come up with this idea of the of using the 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 gram matrices? Yeah, it's uh, you know it's it's a lot less spectacular than than one <laughs> might might hope for because <laughs> really the 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 general idea and this is based on work in texture modeling even from the 60s right so there's uh, work of Bela Julesh from the 60s that um, and and they were modeling textures as uh, average average function responses over an image, right? So you would compute a function at every position of, a, of an image, and then you would just aggregate that function. And so the function in our case is the, the neural network function up to a specific layer. And then, and then you just have to find some way of aggregating these function responses over space. And this, the simplest way would be just to take the average Mm -hmm. And in, in, in fact, that's what we tried immediately because you could say, you know, all the nonlinear computations, they should be taken care of by the neural network. And then you just take the average and, and, and that's your representation. But that didn't work that well. And then it's just, you know, the next step is to look at the second order um, moments of the distribution. And that's where the gram matrix comes in. So it's really just, um, you know, let's, let's just do the minimum. Um, needed uh, non-linearity or, or uh, extract the minimum needed information from the distribution. And if the ground matrix wouldn't have worked, then we you know, would have maybe looked at more like, like, like the histogram or, or higher order moments. And people did that in follow-up work and, and saw some interesting results. But it's, you know, it's not spectacular in a sense. <laughs> at the time, it was brilliant. I think in retrospect, all, all simple things uh, seem like they were simple, but then at, at, at that time, they're, they worked well. So, um, and then uh, what kinds of uh, things uh, have you done after that, like in, in that area? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we did a couple of follow-up works, or, or actually one one follow-up work with uh, people at Adobe, actually with Aaron Hertzman and and Ali Schechtman, uh, where we tried to control that process better and and also show how we can really scale that up uh, to you know do like ten megapixel high resolution images. It, it's just like a cost to find technique. It's you know not not groundbreaking, but it works really well. Um, and then I was, you know, there were so many follow up works and really exciting stuff. But sometimes you know you try to find like a bit of a different niche at some point, right? right. And so I started to look at um, uh, saliency maps and saliency maps in terms of where people would look in an image, right? So given an image, uh, predict the probability distribution of, of where people will, are likely to fixate, um, and then try to change or augment images uh, to change these, um, these patterns of where people would fixate. And it worked to some extent, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't necessarily as exciting as one would hope for, and, and mainly because it feels like high level image information always dominates uh, low level image structure so um you know even if you introduce a very salient contrast at some part of the image if there's a face at a different part of the image everybody will still look at the face right, right? and but the idea was really uh, the you know that you have these neural networks that learn to predict human behavior right that learn to predict where people look in the image or uh, different high-level aspects of the image, and then turn that around to change the image in a way so that human behavior would change in response to that image. And I think you know I've I've seen like a handful of other works that explore that direction, and uh, some some of them really interesting. I feel like a critical component there, and and you know some people have have really focused on that is uh, user input, mm -hmm. right? So. With style transfer, you have like very minimal user input, right? You just have the content image and the style image. Right. But often, like creating new media, creating new images, is a very iterative process, as you know everybody would know. And then, what are the right intuitive knobs to really make things look like you want them to look like, but for which it's difficult to really specify it on a low level, mm -hmm. right? So that's really exciting, but um, I I haven't had too much success in that in that yeah. direction. No, I think it's something um, I wanted to try as well. So I, I, um, what I wanted to try was like um, take like um, I work in animation, so uh, take a animated film style from two D style and maybe map that to a three D style animation. Um, but for animation, the silhouettes and the character boundaries, they are so important that you probably want to apply the style mostly to the background, but not to the main characters, or maybe some, but not all of it, while preserving the silhouettes. And, and I haven't figured out quite the right knobs to turn for that, too. Do you have any advice in that regard? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> I mean, with video, it's even trickier, right? Because well, at least that was true for when looking at these paintings that there is no real, you know, like true solution for a painted video because it doesn't really exist in a sense, even though some people, but you know, there's no like, no, no clear, what is a true um, impressionist video, right? Nobody knows because it doesn't really exist um, for animation. So, you know, one, I think one aspect that is kind of a bit orthogonal to this whole so the way we we modeled style was in terms of texture, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when you have animation, you have all these other components about the dynamics of the animation and and also the composition, right? Of the of how how are images com composed generally in in the style, and that's not really not really captured by texture anymore. And I so if I had you know if I had a wish, wish list of what people would look at in in this field, I think. If somebody could nail how to model the style of image composition, and and I think for 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 movies like the style of transitions and dynamics, right, which is not texture anymore, but it's it's something else, but it's also something that one should be able to extract, 
right? Yeah. If somebody figures that out, I, I, I would be very excited. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <pretty cool. laughs> and um, uh, what kind of things are, are you doing uh, now at Apple, if you can describe it at all? <laughs> yeah, I, so, um, you know, it, uh, of course I can't, I can't uh, go into too many details, but so right now at Apple, I'm, so I joined Apple almost like three and a half years ago and I transitioned a bit away from, from images uh, and I'm I'm working on the health AI team now, and uh, sort of it might sound like a big transition, but really what in excited me about images was mostly of how people perceive images and like the perceptual experience, and so I was really always interested in this human component, um, and so then it's you know much more natural transition that now I'm interested in modeling human physiology and and sort of different aspects of human experience, right? And how can we model them and what 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 uh, does it mean? And so, uh, yeah, I, you know, it's difficult to go into details, but we we did, I had an intern, it's actually two years ago now, we published a, a workshop paper where we looked at, for example, how predictive app usage patterns are of cognitive decline. And it's actually quite interesting. So we had, it was just a small scale data set, but, the bottom line is that you can really see that uh, subjects or patients who uh, are facing the onset of cognitive decline or even early stages of Alzheimer's, uh, they look that they use their phones quite differently to healthy older adults. And healthy older adults use their phones a lot more like younger adults, whereas um, people where, you know who, who face the onset of, of this disease, it's it's. Um, you can clearly see that certain, so for example, they text a lot less and they, you, you know, they do phone calls a lot more. Um, they do a lot less of these quick interactions with the phone where they just open the phone, you know, quickly do something in an app and close it again. It's more like uh, they open it and then they do multiple things and, you know, do like a longer session. Yeah. So they're very interesting, interesting patterns there. Um, and so, you know, overall, that's that's kind of the the, the scope of, of what I'm looking at is really from from wearable sensors and so on. What can we infer about uh, you know human experience really and human health? Okay, no, that sounds very exciting. I think looking forward to hearing more about it if uh, it becomes available on devices or paper later on. Um, and then, uh, do you have any advice for um, like new? students uh, entering the field or trying to learn like what kinds of things they should focus on? What's the key learning uh, in machine learning? Like I know there are like models that come out every day and people uh, want to focus on those, but like what are the basic things that people should kind of stick to and understand about machine learning? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. I mean, now that, <laughs> Now that I'm in industry, and uh, actually the, my time in industry has just changed my point of view quite a bit in a sense that I think a lot of the machine learning community is working on beating benchmarks. And that's, you know, that's great. Like uh, it's great to evaluate machine learning techniques on well-defined benchmarks and so on and so forth. But if you really face the problem of thinking about what happens if I ship this machine learning algorithms algorithm to a million of users or millions of users, and you really try to think through all the consequences, then suddenly the focus of your work shifts dramatically, right? Like the exact model architecture or you know beating like half a percent on a benchmark becomes pretty irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And you think a lot more about is this model, do I understand this model? Is this model robust under all possible domain shifts that I might envision in, in the field? Um, and really, and you know, of course, all these questions about fairness. And I, I think for the big tech companies, it's very important this aspect of this will change society, right? If like 100 million people is, or if, if this, this is impacting 100 million people, this will change society, right? And what does that mean? What, what are the collective impacts of this technology on, on the population? And is that something we want to stand behind, right? And this, of course, these decisions are not necessarily made by the individual uh, researcher or engineer, but having awareness of that uh, and, and um, incorporating that in your model design and in your model iteration is is essential 
and it takes a lot more time uh, that you and you you hardly ever think about that in industry and even if you do papers on fairness and bias and so on which is you know is great and important it's easy because you don't ship the thing out to a lot of users right so you can you can still you can just evaluate on the fairness benchmark and you know you see an improvement it's great you publish the paper but you know you don't have to take the responsibility for everything mm -hmm. that might right. follow after <laughs> that's great advice yeah i think because i've been reading a lot about um, yeah the implicit biases both in data and the uh, researchers and the algorithms so um, yeah those things uh, do become important at scale when you deploy those things so thank you again for um, being with us um, this has been uh, a great honor for me to uh, have you on this uh, class and talk to you thank you yeah, thank you so much. I hope uh, it was helpful. I hope people people enjoyed. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, thank you so much again. And uh, right. I hope yeah, you know the the class and everything is going well. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right. So that was great. So um, we talked with. Um, Leon, and um, let me share my slides with you. And oh no, the stream yard is showing me dark. All right, give me a minute here. Can you all see me? At SIGGRAPH 2020, more than 10,000 individuals from 95 countries gathered virtually to experience over 350 hours of content presented by more than 1,600 contributors. What resulted was pure SIGGRAPH. Robotic advances use subtractive fabrication techniques to carve foam and similar materials like an artist. Modeling and predictive computation creates a more robust and accurate time-stepping of nonlinear elastodynamics. New investigation into damage simulation could change the landscape of video and game effects as well as surgical training. Novel healthcare technologies point toward new ways to transform and enhance lives. Research will help users to create reprogrammable multicolor textures made from a single material. AI-driven technology pushes the capabilities of crowd simulation. Award-winning animation showcases the latest in computer graphics. Real-time and gaming technology advancements transform interactive storytelling techniques and explore new applications of the technology. Evocative digital artwork uses machine learning to create visceral... Hello again. Well, sorry about the crash. So uh, uh, let's pick up uh, where we left off. So I'm sharing the slides now. Hopefully you can see all the slides. Uh, we talked with Leon and um, he talked about uh, artistic style transfer. That is um, one of the major papers he wrote um, a few years ago. And um, 
And this is um, uh, an image from his paper. Uh, essentially, you take uh, in an input image that is um, the style and another image that is the content. And you want to create um, a new image that has um, the style that you gave as input. So uh, it, it's a, a traditional uh, convolutional neural network um, where then he takes the layers of different um, um, parts of this model and then um, does uh, two kinds of losses, uh, one for content, one for style, and then mixes them with um, this alpha and beta features that you can combine the uh, you can combine the two two images uh, and then gives you a resulting image that has the style um, of the style input that you gave. So um, we'll cover that in a little bit more detail at a um, uh, in a later class um, or maybe towards the end of the day today. Um, but that's the general idea behind um, artistic style transfer. So today uh, we're going to do a quick recap on distributions in the autoencoder. We'll cover CNNs. We'll talk about a little bit more about the data pipeline and uh, denoising. And if we have time left, we'll talk about transfer learning and using pre-trained models from other sources. So for the hands-on today, uh, I have a bunch of files that I'm sharing with you. So uh, make sure you make copies of this in your own drive. And uh, we'll refer to these files as we go along to the course. So last time we talked about um, autoencoders where you had um, an earlier view of our fully connected network, which looked something like this, where each node is connected to the previous node and you have some hidden layers and you have input uh, in the beginning and an output in the end. And uh, for the regression kind of things, we have single output that gives you some kind of an answer. Uh, in terms of classification, you would have multiple outputs for E1 for each of the class that you're trying to predict. So. Autoencoder is essentially um, the same kind of network, except you squish it. So you squish it in the middle, and that becomes um, your encoded data. So essentially, you take the input, and you process it through some layers, and you start kind of squishing it down. And um, once you reach that middle layer that is called the bottleneck layer, you get some representation of the input data that is now essentially compressed into fewer nodes. And um, towards the other end, to recreate from this compressed um, uh, information, you start expanding the network. And um, once you get to that uh, original size of the network, you would get some representation of the input image. And the idea is to make the input as close to the output as possible. So that's the loss we would use as the difference between the two. And once you've trained the network, it learns all of that. So at that point, what you can do is you can cut this network in half, and you can use uh, this compressed thing to kind of generate the image that you want. So that's the idea behind autoencoders. So it's used as a compression scheme. Um, or to encode data. So this particular, uh, the two red nodes that you see here, they don't have to be two. They can be four. They can be anything, really. Um, and that um, is the uh, one of the latent spaces in the bottleneck layer. In fact, all of these layers, they will represent some kind of a high dimensional space where your data is there. Uh, you, It's hard to visualize in this multi-dimensional space for what your data looks like. Um, but it is there. It may be some weird function of uh, multidimensional attributes, but uh, it is somehow encapsulating your data into a smaller number of nodes. So it's it's a lossy compression because you can never faithfully recover the entire input exactly unless you train it so much. But because of this bottleneck layer, you're making sure that it's um, always some kind of a compression that happens. And because of that compression, the final image that you get out is never going to be exactly the same, but it's going to be close enough. So. Um, one thing we can do is we can feed images. So images are basically numbers. We can um, convert all images to numbers and feed an input uh, image to this encoder part of the autoencoder. And the resulting I there is the uh, latent representation at the bottleneck. And then you can decode it. 
um, by expanding the network again and reconstruct the output. So by training over time, you would start getting uh, good results where the input is almost the same as the output. And um, we will do exactly that in our um, code next. So the code looks something like this. It's very similar to the fully connected um, network that we made earlier, except um, we are now decreasing the number of nodes in our hidden network. So um, we start out with 128. So um, images that we'll use, they are um, uh, a certain size. So we are going to flatten them and uh, convert them into basically a long list of numbers. Uh, and that will be 128 numbers. And we are going to feed that. And um, as it gets um, smaller in size, um, at this point, you will have some kind of a latent representation of uh, in 32 nodes. So that 128 gets compressed to 32 um, and then on to uh, 784. So actually, the input is um, uh, 784 units. So let's um, look at the code. So I'm sharing the code uh, tab now. Are you all able to see it? Hopefully, yes. OK, so just like before, we are going to import some packages. And this is how we are going to get the data set for the something called MNIST, which is handwritten digits. Uh, it's a grayscale set of data. and um, Let's take a look at uh, what this data looks like and what the images are. So there are 60,000 images in here. Um, each um, is a 28 by 28 um, size. So dimension is 28 by 28. And because they are grayscale, so which means each pixel, uh, we can represent it as a, a grayscale number. Um, so 28 by 28, um, if you multiply it together, it's um, 784. No, what is it? Twenty-eight times twenty-eight. Yeah. So, so that would be the size of our input. So imagine that. Like our network is now suddenly very huge. Um, so we will. Uh, it's already partitioned into training and testing. So we can look at that. So these are the partitions. Um, this are the first few numbers, 5, 0, and 4. So it has a label, which we are not going to use. So we can try plotting the first 10 images. So this is how you get uh, an image out using an index. And you just plot it. So these are the first 10 images in the data set. So they're basically um, grayscale images, um, numbers, handwritten. So, so far, so good. Next, we are going to make our model. And um, the way you do it is, again, a sequential model. Input layer is 28 by 28. So because this is a two-dimensional thing, we are going to flatten it into a one long list of numbers. So 28 by 28 gets flattened into 784 numbers. And this is the call that we'll use is flatten. Um, and then we add more layers, um, 128, and then so on. So this is very small. Um, uh, all encoder that we're building. So we're just compressing it down to, from uh, uh, 784, we're compressing it down to 128. And that's it. So we can uh, have the model, create summary of it. So you'll see that the model is already pretty big. And um, and you can do the math and figure out, like, this is, these are the numbers. So 201,000 parameters, that's a lot of numbers. Um, so let's take a look. And you can um, not only like um, look at the model data like this, the shapes of things, but you can also look at, look at each layer. So there's API to get the layers of the model, and then you can see the layer names. So you can do more processing on the layers later on. So we'll compile the model, give it an optimizer and a loss as before, and train it. So again, we're building a very short autoencoder, which will Basically, take this data, compress it down to 128 nodes, and then expand it back. 
So because now the network is huge, um, it is taking a little bit of time to go through each of the batches and depots. While this is going on, um, it'll take a few more seconds. Um, any questions you have, uh, please uh, type it up. And so this is the basic building block. Like we'll graduate to CNNs from here um, using similar principles. So you can see the loss is decreasing, and that's what we want. Okay, so we could train it for longer and it'll get better over time, but uh, let's stop here because it's going to take a while. Um, so 10 box is good. Um, so I wrote this little bit of code to kind of plot the original against the decoded. So the way you call this is um, essentially just make a list of all the images. So what we're going to do is then now start predicting on the test data. So we take first 10 images out of the test data and then for each of the image we'll call model.predict and don't worry about this expand them these are just uh, tensorflow idiosyncrasies we are converting from batches to images and uh, those are just things that are part of the api that we need to use to convert things into the right format so and the squeeze is the opposite of expand dims where we convert it back into the batches so the main part here is that we're predicting for the first 10 images in the test set, and uh, we are making a list of uh, 10 of those so that we can plot them using uh, this uh, show results, which essentially plots original and decoded both. So let's uh, see the results. So there they are, um, original versus decoded. So they look very similar. So it's um, network has done a great job. There are parts where don't look as good. There is some extra stuff here um, in the nine that you see. The in, in the last nine, there is like some blurriness here. That is to be expected because we're not going to get an exact representation. But uh, imagine we have taken uh, an image that was 28 by 28 and then compressed it down to 128 nodes. So that's our factor of compression. So that's like a six times as small. So, so that's a pretty good compression that we are getting for this kind of reconstruction. So what you can do now is try more things. So we can make this better. You can try it running for longer. Uh, as long as the losses keep going down, um, you're in good shape. Uh, another thing you can do is drastically reduce it further. So instead of uh, reducing to 128, you can try to see what happens if you reduce it to just um, like 32. And So now our network is like severely, severely compressing this thing. Um, and um, it should um, well run faster, and it will give worse results. But the compression factor is amazing for this kind of thing. So let's let this run. Again, questions, type up. So we'll go through this kind of exercise a lot where things will train a little bit. Again, we are using online collab in the cloud. Um, we are getting some kind of a machine um, which is doing all this processing. So even though this is a toy example, um, it, it takes a while for all the things to work out properly. So Let's uh, predict with the severe compressions. So now you see the results are a little bit worse, um, but the amount of compression that we have gotten is uh, it's kind of mind boggling that you can still reconstruct this with a 24x compression. 
So that's autoencoder. So let me look at uh, the chat if we have any questions here. All right. So far, no questions. So let's move on to the next topic. So we did that. So what happens in the intermediate layers um, is that you're getting um, this kind of a partitioning of source um, where things are getting separated into numbers. And then uh, these digits that we saw, they kind of get their own little clusters and distributions. So what I emphasized last time, and I want to keep emphasizing this, is that you want to start thinking of things in terms of distributions, where uh, what you are trying to do is find something similar to the distribution of your data. And it will lie within that distribution somewhere. You don't know that. So if you think of it as a multiverse of a distribution um, that is existing in some imaginary world, then all the ones are here. All the different kinds of ones that could possibly exist uh, are in this yellow range. And the one that you are trying to find is somewhere there. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're trying to find that one sample that exists within that distribution. And through this exercise of training, we are first locating that distribution and then finding the one sample that is uh, going to give you the right results. So that is uh, common. And that is uh, what happens in almost every neural network. So it's all about distributions. So you can think of it as your own um, learning experience where when you grow up and look at the world and learn from the world, you have essentially figured out like what uh, what a car looks like. If something that has four wheels and a uh, car-like shape is probably a car. And even if you come across something like a novelty car, which has wings on it, you can still say, oh, this is a car probably because I've seen what cars look like. I know the car distribution. And even though this exact car I have not seen before, this probably belongs in the distribution of cars. So, so that's how you learn. And for somebody who has never seen a car and they see a car, they would not know what it is. So that's uh, what you want is like you want to collect data and train on data that is representative of the class of things that you are trying to predict from. So if you never capture the ones at all in this data and you train with it and suddenly you give it one to predict, it will probably fail. So uh, autoencoders work just fine. Um, and as we argued in the first class, that a simple network is all you need. Um, the only problem is that um, well, there are many problems, but the main problem is that size explosion happens when you have a fully connected network like um, like a, an autoencoder or, or the ones that we had before. The second issue is that in the intermediate layers, as I said, there is some latent space where your data is getting embedded. Um, in autoencoder, it's in a compressed form. Um, it, it's somewhere um, a multidimensional data. We don't understand those spaces. Um, they're not as clean as I'm showing here. You can visualize this in three dimensions, but imagine a higher dimensional space where you don't understand the embeddings, you don't visualize them. So uh, the next uh, network that we're going to talk about, the convolutional neural network, is um, does kind of solve both of the issues. It, it's um, not fully connected uh, in a way. It, um, it, it is fully connected, but in a way, it, it um, has fewer nodes as you go along. Um, and the second part is that it works kind of like the human vision system, where each of the subsequent layers is trying to understand a little bit more about the images where um, the lower level details coalesce into higher level details. And as you go along the network, you find high, more higher level features. So you're able to understand the images better. This is exactly how a human vision system works. Um, and we will try to model that. So let's take a look at what um, CNN is. So 
Uh, CNN is modeled uh, essentially very similarly, like um, like an autoencoder um, or a fully connected network, except at each of the layers, um, the CNN layers. What you're going to do is um, uh, run a kernel. So a kernel is nothing but um, uh, you take a three by three grid, for example, and then uh, apply some weights uh, to the pixel. Um, um, so three by three pixels, and then you move a little bit to the right, and then apply it again, and then you move a little bit to the right so until you've covered the entire image. So, and then the result that you get from applying the kernel, say nine by nine kernel, or three by three kernel of nine pixels, you get one pixel out of that. So in a way, you are kind of reducing the size of your network, but at the same time, you're capturing some feature detail as an average by running that kernel. So you can have different kinds of kernels, and you use this practice of convolution of images already in Photoshop for edge detection or other applications. But applying them here in a neural network gives you two advantages. One is that you're now able to visualize these features as intermediate layers. And secondly, because of this um, uh, compression effect where you are averaging pixels and the resulting pixel, uh, you're converting from like nine pixels to one pixels. So that's uh, what the visualization of the kernel looks like. So this is a three by three kernel in light green that is kind of running over your image. And it um, basically uh, takes the average, um, beta average of um, the nine pixels and moves on to the next part of the image and so on. So we will try to implement that, and um, we will do some denoising with this. So image denoising um, is a topic um, that um, is close to my heart because I've worked on this uh, for a while. Um, what you try to do is you take a noisy image that is shown on the left half of the, this uh, slide, and then you try to convert it to a denoised image. Um, so you still need some ground truth so you can train. And but when it um, is trained, you can then give it noisy images and it'll output denoised image. It works very well in practice, um, and it's based on one of the papers from Disney Research uh, and Pixar and Disney Animation. Um, so you can read about the paper. The network's big and complex, but the idea is uh, straightforward. So you give it um, a noisy image and the ground truth and um, many sets of this, train it through the network, and your loss would be the difference between the two, and you can train through. So uh, the idea would be, again, you're finding a distribution, you're finding similar images, and trying to find that one image that uh, you can denoise. So um, again, the network is straightforward, where you build your network, uh, have a set of noisy images, so what I work with is the rendered images where we have access to noisy images because of the way ray tracing works. Uh, in practice, you may not have access to a noisy version. So what you can do is you can take any image and add noise to it. So it's easy to add noise. Um, so this part uh, you'll also come across many times in um, machine learning where you are creating data. So you don't have data, but you are able to create data using some procedural method. Um, so that part is called data augmentation. You can add noise to it. You can rotate your images to create more data. You can transform them in slightly. So uh, all this is kind of data augmentation. Um, it's nice to be able to generate data. You don't have to go hunt on the web for noisy images. You can just take a normal image, add noise to it. Um, and because it's used so often, um, most of the toolkits um, like um, TensorFlow, PyTorch, they all support some method of creating this data pipeline. So we'll, we'll do all of that, but we need some more uh, engineering to make this more robust and the data processing faster, because now we are going to be dealing with uh, larger images, and uh, things get complicated. So what? let's do that. Let's take a look at this uh, file called uh, data pipeline. TensorFlow has the concept of uh, something called TensorFlow dataset. 
So similar to before, we import some packages. And we are going to download some data called UC Merced. So this is a data of satellite images. And the TensorFlow data sets um, uh, is a sub package within TensorFlow. We are going to use that to download this data set. So data sets are kind of specially curated data sets available in TensorFlow um, that researchers used for uh, practice and testing. This is a large largest data set, not huge. This is 317 megabytes of data. It'll take a couple of minutes to download. So what's nice about this, it's just all clean. It's prepared nicely. It's labeled. Um, so you don't have to mess too much with the data. So it's downloading still. Any questions so far? Please post them. So some of these data sets can be huge. And that's why we are working through this, um, this particular file is the data pipeline, where uh, we will try to make it as efficient as possible to process this large amount of data. And you'll see how. So once it downloads, let it download, and I'll talk more about um, what we are trying to do here. So just like before, we take the data and we split it into training and um, testing. So let's say our training size is 70% of the data. And um, the data set has these methods like uh, pandas to take the data and um, um, of a certain size. And uh, you can skip the rest of it and put it in the testing. So 70% for training, 30% for testing. Um, Next thing we can do is because this data is large, and we if we try to feed an image of the size 256 by 256, the network will get overwhelmed. So we have to build a huge network. The memory and the compute um, limitations won't allow us to do that. So what we will do is instead we will train on small patches of this, these images. and. Um, one way to do that is to first take out the patches from the image. So we wrote a method called extract patch, extract patches that will run through the entire data set and extract the patches. So let's uh, see. So the data is downloaded. Let me show you what this data is about. So it's again, as I said, it's from University of California Merced. It has uh, satellite data of different kinds. There are 2,100 examples. Um, and you can also look at what they are. This is an integer. Um, we can call this show examples. That is going to show nine of the examples from the data sets. Again, satellite images, 256 by 256, standard color images. Um, so now we get to the part where we are going to take this image size, 256 by 256, and extract small patches from it. So this is the code for extracting patches. And our patch size is going to be patch width and patch height, which is same here. And the way you do it is you convert the image to a floating point number. Um, and uh, there is this utility function called extract patches. It looks complicated, but all you're giving it is where to start from, where to end from, and uh, how many patches to extract per image. So we are basically, our stride is patch height and patch width. So we are just doing sequentially, we're trying to extract as many patches as we can from the image. So basically, one image will give you four patches. And uh, then we reconstruct that back into a data set. So, so that's um, something that um, uh, you will do to a lot of the data sets. You'll do some processing. 
So once we do that, then what we will do is um, uh, call another function on each of those. So now uh, our 256 by 256 images get turned into patches of 128 by 128. And we're going to take that and add noise to each of those patches. And add noise um, works in a similar way. We take, um, we take basically some random numbers um, where mean is 0 and then with some standard deviation, which is 0.1, so that we get some noise. And these are just random numbers because images are numbers. So this turns into um, uh, a, a random noise image. And we take that and add it to our original patch. And because adding may increase the value above 1, we do a clipping and return basically a pair. So this is now going to become our um, input data, and this is our ground truth. So noisy patch and the original patch. So that's how you do that. So map call basically um, is going through all the patches and adding noise to them. So next thing we'll do the same thing for the test set except for the test set we don't need to make patches because you want to test on the entire image so we do the extract patches but we have it full size so the good thing about tensorflow data set is that nothing gets executed uh, this is all setting up a pipeline so if you look at any of these individual data structures they're all empty. They are not doing anything. And they are basically setting up a pipeline. So only time the data goes through this is uh, when we do something like take. So from this data set, when we take items, this is when everything gets into motion or the pipeline starts executing. So this is great for when you have data so huge that it um, doesn't fit in the memory anymore. So it can reside on the disk. And TensorFlow will take care of getting the data as you need it. Uh, it will uh, figure out how many processors you have, how many GPs you have. It will partition off all the processing. So this simple workflow will work from in the cloud to a cluster of machines you might have at home to a laptop that you might work. So you don't need to change a single line of code. It will take advantage of all the resources that you have either locally or in the cloud. So that's a good thing to learn for practical machine learning uh, deployment and uh, machine learning operations, uh, how to set up these data processing pipelines and then um, make use of them. So what we'll do now is um, let me execute on all of this. Something bad happened here. Extract patches is not defined because we never executed it. So this is what the batch of the data set looks like. So we're going to take five out of those. And we're just going to plot them. So we're going to plot the noisy part and the original part of the five of those things. So here they are. So this was the original patch. Again, remember, the entire image looks like this. We took a patch 128 by 128 out of this and then added noise to it, which looks something like the one above. So noisy image and um, clean image. So now that we have prepared the data, we can start training and make our um, uh, make our CNN. So looks like we're running out of time. So we'll do the CNN next time. But there is code available in the drive, and you can try it out. It's the exact same code that I showed you just now for the data pipeline mixed in with a CNN. Uh, so CNN is, again, straightforward. You have, instead of um, regular dense layer, you have now convolution layers. So not, not much has changed. So it's exactly the same. And uh, instead of um, regular layers, 
we have convolution layers here. Convolution layers have parameters, same as uh, other layers. And three by three, this is the size of the kernel that we are using. The kernel, remember what I told you about, is basically does the averaging or the weighted averaging of the pixels in the image. So uh, try it out um, at home. Next time we meet, uh, we'll meet only once next week. Um, need uh, I need some break. Um, volunteers need some break. So we'll meet once. But you'll have one full week to try this out on your own. Um, and then we'll run this uh, next time and cover some other things. So. The thing is this um, denoising that we are doing, we can do multiple things like denoising because they're all kind of like um, a same algorithm. You can remove tint. Uh, you can do some in-painting in images with holes. You can do dirt removal. You can colorize an image even. Um, so all you need to do is provide um, two sets of images or two patches of images, one is Original image, noisy image, same thing with um, uprising or in betweening or colorization. So this is general kind of degraded image versus clean image kind of algorithm where you can apply it to many different problems for image fixing. So you can try these out. Um, and we'll cover the CNN next time. So some other things that you can do for your homework is, um, as I said, I'm giving you some code snippets here on how to, uh, similar to how we made noisy image, you can also um, kind of make uh, desaturated images using this particular function. Uh, you can uh, uh, do uprising where you can make smaller images um, and resize them again where it will kind of degrade it, um, make it blocky or pixelated. You can make holes in the images. So this particular masking mechanism will make holes in the images that you can try to fill with the machine learning. Or you can also do frame interpolation where you take any video from YouTube, take like every alternate frame, um, and then use the middle frame as um, what you are trying to predict. So that way you can do some frame interpolation as well. So let's stop here, and I'll take any last few questions you might have. We covered a lot of stuff today, and uh, I think it's going to be, once we get to the next class, it's going to be where it turns you this from an introductory to a little bit more advanced course where you can not just have toy examples, but you can apply it to real problems. So. Uh, There's a good question about there are many model architectures for neural networks and how do you get an intuition for the architectural difference? So I think um, the machine learning research community, especially with regards to the models, uh, has gotten into a bad habit of naming everything. Um, even slight differences in model get renamed. So if you look at the generative adversarial network, you will see like hundreds of papers with the uh, different names, like they're all GANs essentially. And the only thing that is different about them is how they model their losses um, and slight tweaks here and there. So you can think of um, essentially any kind of imaging based network will use some form of a CNN or a convolutional network. Uh, so that's the mainstay of uh, most of the image processing things. Um, there are, generative networks which can generate new data and those are a different class so you can think of this those networks as generative networks so that we learn about them more um, so in essence there are like only three or four main things that you need to remember there's um, an autoencoder like thing there is a cnn there is generative networks and then we learn about transformers later on um, uh, as well so, so that's like four or five things only. And then rest of them are more about how to configure the losses. And um, any other questions?
Right. So noise um, that you get in images are not random. So the ones that I work with is is um, Monte Carlo noise from ray tracing. It has specific characteristics. Um, but uh, again, this is a class. So I want to give you an idea of what it is to kind of remove um, noise or remove uh, artifacts from an image. The process is going to be similar. I think um, the network should be able to capture that specific characteristic. And if it is not capturing this specific characteristic, then you can tweak the network. You can tweak the network. You can provide other kinds of inputs. The more information you have about what is causing the degradation, um, the better the network can get if you provide more information. For example, in denoising ray traced images, we can provide normal maps. We can provide albedo or other kinds of information that, that a normal the denoising network might not have. So giving that extra input kind of teaches it to learn the specifics about um, that particular noise. So, so you can do that. So I think we are using random plus standard dev because it's easy to do, it's easy to teach, and but the process remains similar. All right, so I don't want to go too much over time. Um, so let's stop here and uh, do the homework. And uh, whoever does the homework the best, I will uh, give you a copy of uh, Francois's book, um, and I'll mail it to you. So I'll choose one winner next time. Send me your homework on Twitter or LinkedIn, and uh, I'll send you a copy of this book. All right. Thank you. At SIGGRAPH 2020, more than 10,000 individuals from 95 countries gathered virtually to experience over 350 hours of content presented by more than 1,600 contributors. What resulted was pure SIGGRAPH. Robotic advances use subtractive fabrication techniques to carve foam and similar materials like an artist. Modeling and predictive computation creates a more robust and accurate time-stepping of nonlinear elastodynamics. New investigation into damage simulation could change the landscape of video and game effects as well as surgical training. Novel healthcare technologies point toward new ways to transform and enhance lives. Research will help users to create reprogrammable multicolor textures made from a single material. AI-driven technology pushes the capabilities of crowd simulation. Award-winning animation showcases the latest in computer graphics. Real-time and gaming technology advancements transform interactive storytelling techniques and explore new applications of the technology. Evocative digital artwork uses machine learning to create visceral experiences. Now is the time to share your research, your innovations, and your creative inspiration. SIGGRAPH is your community, and we hope you'll share your work with SIGGRAPH 2021.